Hello and welcome to On Point Presents. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. We are streaming live from the WBUR City Space YouTube channel and you can subscribe to get notified whenever we release a new video. Just press the bell icon next to the subscribe button to get notified whenever we go live. Tonight, we are here for conversation with Jill Lepore, the Harvard historian, two-time Pulitzer finalist, and we're gonna be talking about her new book, If Then, how the Simulatics Corporation invented the future, the future we are all living in right now. And we want you to be part of this conversation, and we are receiving and wanna to continue to receive some great questions, so if you haven't submitted yours yet, you can do so anytime. Throughout the next hour, go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and use the event code ONPOINT. That's all one word, all lowercase, ONPOINT, and we will do our best to get as many of your questions uh, as we can into this conversation. So first of all, let's just dive right in and let me say Jill Lepore, Professor Lepore, welcome to this conversation. It's really great to talk to you again. Hey, thanks so much. It's great to be sort of not there, but here and also there <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, as I've told, I don't know, some folks might have seen me do other uh, recent local events. I keep telling them I'm coming live from my daughter's fifth grade classroom. <laughs> <laughs> but but so, so this is an incredible, incredible book. And I actually think it's a book that's providing a public service right now. Uh, but Jill, I just, I actually want to start with the beginning of your story, which starts in 1952, in fact with this New York ad man. And it's election night, 1952, and he's watching CBS News, right? He, he's wrapped by what's happening on CBS News. And we actually have a little bit of archival sound from that broadcast. So let's listen to here to first Walter Cronkite on November 4th, 1952. Okay, great. Let's turn to that miracle of the modern age, the electronic brain Univac and uh, Charles Collingwood. This is the face of a Univac. A Univac is a fabulous electronic machine which we have borrowed to help us predict this election from the basis of the early returns as they come in. Let me tell you a little bit about the theory of this. This is not a joke or a trick. It's an experiment. We think it's going to work. We don't know, we hope it'll work. At any rate, for the last six weeks or so, some 25 mathematicians, statisticians, and researchers, including some of the country's best mathematical brains, have been working on the problem which we've given to this electronic brain to try to solve for us tonight. You know, the theory is pretty simple. It is that uh, if you knew all about previous elections, if you knew how the votes came in and so forth, then as the votes come in in this election, you ought to be able to compare them with what happened in the past and judge what the result will be uh, tonight. So that was the voice of Charles Collingwood, legendary CBS newsman. You heard a little bit of Walter Cronkite there. But this guy, Jill, Ed Greenfield, he's sitting there enraptured, mesmerized, as you write, by this. Who is Ed and why was he mesmerized? Yeah, well, I mean, I, maybe I'm projecting myself. I find that clip so compelling it's like ground zero you know it's the first time for most americans that they've ever seen a computer right like there are no personal computers you don't have computers at work like there's like the computer there's this one that's been used to count the census really they've heard the univac it's the first commercially available computer and it's built for the census bureau to count the 1950 census um, and then CBS gets this idea they could use it on election night so the people would watch election night because otherwise who would watch vote counting on TV. Um, so Greenfield, he's he's a New York ad man. It's the, it's the heyday, the real beginning of the big Madison Avenue boom in the 1950s. Suddenly, you know, every corner has an ad agency on it. And Ed Greenfield, super smart, incredibly charming, uh, you know, glad handler, like just a debonair kind of sexy guy, your basic, you know, New York madman. Yeah. A schemer, self-promoter, uh, really, you know, a bit of a huckster, but also a very, you know, determined liberal. Right? He's, he's unusual in Madison Avenue that he's a Democrat. These big, these ad agencies, a lot of big businesses, they're selling their services to big businesses. They're, Repu they're guys, they're Republican guys. Um, so 
Greenfield's watching the news that night. He's just mesmerized by the the thrill of this gigantic electronic print. I mean, they sell it so hard on CVS. It doesn't even work, but they are just selling, 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 selling. Because they're as much selling the idea that you should watch television on election night as they're selling the Univac. And so yeah. they're really pushing it. But we know, but what... Collingwood does actually in that little clip and I mean it goes on for a long time I just picked like a little section of it I mean he goes into detail about like we have these mathematicians we're feeding the computer information and, and it, like here's the idea he's talking about like the idea that they can apply statistical sciences to get to a really quick um, determination of who would have won the 1952 election and that's the thing that I think is like really amazing about that moment um, so what is it about this concept that you could fill a machine full of data that ad man, madman Ed Greenfield's like yeah. I know what to do with that yeah yeah I mean it's just this, this seed is planted in his brain um, I think there's a tremendous, I mean, the, the reason my book, the subtitle is, that, yeah, this company invented the future. There's an incredible turn culturally during the Cold War to prediction and to using, be, using the study of human behavior as a way to predict how the future will turn out. And part of that is just the kind of Manichaean battle of the Cold War, right? Trying to sort of, mm -hmm. this is battle between communism and capitalism. What's going to happen? Well, we have scholars who can make a prediction. Like that is, that, that stuff that is kind of everywhere in our culture now. I mean, it's not kind of, it is everywhere in our culture now, uh, but it was new then, right? Like it, the idea that, especially that, that it could be mathematically precise. Mm -hmm. So Greenfield gets this idea, you know, the Democrats, uh, lose that election. Adlai Stevenson, governor of Illinois, is the Democratic nominee. He loses to Dwight, much beloved Dwight Eisenhower, who's run this huge TV ad campaign in 1952. And Greenfield, you know, wants Stevenson to win. Stevenson loses. And he, what he walks away from that election night thinking is, I bet we could use this giant electronic brain to win back the White House. That somehow, if you could use a computer to predict human behavior and electoral behavior, voter behavior, then surely you could you you could run a campaign that way and no one had really thought about that before so it's yeah. it's 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 also just such a he's got just so much chutzpah you know but he also it's a great business idea if you could if you could predict how humans are going to behave right that's what advertising is selling anyway right like we're telling you yeah you know, we're gonna if, you, if we put this ad in in you know in the new york times people are going to buy maytag instead of westinghouse like that's what that's the product that ad campaigns advertising agencies are in. but if, no we mathematically can predict it because we have a giant electronic brain back here like it, it's just a huge idea well, so, you know, it's interesting because I actually hadn't thought about it in that way until just this moment when you said it, because it is quite a leap from saying, let's use a computer to quickly tabulate election results. Uh, Collingwood talks about how they can do 2,000 calculations a minute, which was so wonderful, <laughs> quaint, through 2020 years. But, but, so, but it's a big leap between that and saying, let's use the same computational power to predict human behavior. But of course an ad person would think that because that's the business they're in. Like you're saying, like, like behavior shaping through advertising. So, so he kind of puts these worlds together, Greenfield does, right? And who does he turn to, to then build what becomes this company? Yeah, so it takes him a while to educate himself yeah. about this work and who's doing it. And then he's kind of like the Danny Ocean in Ocean's Eleven, like to gather together the team that can pull off the heist. But if you think about it, um, in the 1950s, okay, so finally there's a main, you know there's mainframe computers available. A lot of social scientists are interested in doing predictive work. What are they going to study? They're going to study elections, because the problem with doing a prediction on a computer, you need to have enough. You have, to have fair what they call massive data, which we would call big data, but you needed to have a lot of data. So people engaged in bit, political scientists studying the behavior of voters have. It generates its own data, right? You have the census already. Then you have election returns, which are you know down to the precinct level, and then you also have public opinion polls, which early pollsters are already doing, you know, on punch cards. Gallup mm -hmm. and Roper are doing this stuff on punch cards. So you actually it, it generates its own data, and then you can verify the data because if you make a prediction, you can see how the election turned out, right? Like it's if you, if you were trying to come up with a good realm of human activity with which to engage in quantitative predictive behavioral science 
you'd pick voting first. It'd be absolutely yeah. the first thing you do because the data is already already there. It's a question of working with it. So he begins to meet these people. So Adlai Stevenson runs for gov runs for president again in 1956, and Greenfield, whose ad agency is also a political consulting company, gets a big contract working for the Stevenson campaign in California. They're going to run his primary campaign essentially. And so Greenfield goes to California, and that's where he meets the first guys he wants to bring on board this team. They do work for him for the Stevenson campaign, beginning with this guy, Eugene Burdick from yeah. UC Berkeley, who's my favorite guy. He's a surfer and a deep sea diver and uh, a quite accomplished political theorist and a Rhodes Scholar and a democratic strategist. <laughs> and. Uh, he later becomes uh, the the chief spokesman for Ballantine Ale because they want to sell a manlier <laughs> brew of beer. He's just like they don't make characters like this. <laughs> so he works for Greenfield, and then this this guy who's then at the Hoover Institution, which is now part of Stanford, Ithiel de Sola Pool, who later goes on spends most of his career at MIT, who's a quantitative political scientist. Those are like the first two guys that Greenfield puts together um, to think about voting behavior and its possible use. Um, in coming up with a way to program a machine to simulate an election in order to provide campaign advice. So Stevenson loses again in 1956, and they start working together and looking for other people to work on what for a long time Greenfield calls an issues univac. He wants to develop a univac, just like the one that CBS News used, but that instead of predicting the outcome of an election, would predict the outcome of voters' response to a candidate's changing position on the issues. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, the two other people he brings on board in around 1958 are um, Bill McPhee, who's at Columbia, who does the math for this computer simulation of election, uh, and Alex Bernstein, who was at the time at IBM, who's the first guy who programmed a computer to play chess. So he has like the best and the brightest from across the country. Well, so can you tell me a little bit more, actually, I'm going to talk about Poole quite a bit more in, in a few minutes, but tell me more about McPhee, because he's really interesting. Yeah, so too. McPhee, um, guy from Colorado, really brilliant mathematical mind. Uh, he dropped out of Yale to go fight in the war. He was a, he was a fighter pilot um, and then goes to gets recruited to go to Columbia to get a PhD in the um, Bureau of Social Science Research. Um, he you know, like all of these guys has, you know, he's married young, they have the kind of classic baby boom family, you know, has, has, uh, he has three kids in the 1950s. His wife's a nursery school teacher, her name is Minnow McPhee. And um, he's extremely unstable. Uh, I mean, if you think about the, you know, the Edward Albee, like, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf faculty mm -hmm. marriage? That's this moment, right? Like that, that's the, 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 the demeaning of women uh, the distortion of women's intellect from being unable to be a part of academic life and be um, producers of ideas and, and holders of knowledge. So McPhee and his wife, like all these guys, have really a very complicated marriage, but McPhee also suffers from mental illness. And as he's finishing his dissertation, which is this mathematical model um, that can program and simulate an election, uh, his wife has him committed to Bellevue. He's become dangerous, but he's also delusional. Uh, it's a very sad, sad family story. Um, but there are these kind of just, you know, manic letters that he types. He gets it, borrows a typewriter in Bellevue. Where he's typing out the theory of the simulation of the electorate. Um, I, I just found that kind of chilling in the archives when I found those letters. I found them in Chicago, um, in an archive at the University of Chicago. And it's just like, this is where... Cambridge Analytica was born in a madhouse, you know, the, this, this, this fantasy that you could control people's behavior by predicting it and then manipulating it, um, I, it's no way to live. Um, and somehow it, it means something to me that it came, mm -hmm. came out of a manic episode. It's so interesting. So I'm going to just read a little section from the book. So the, the company is officially... Uh, opened or uh, launched in 1959, right? Um, and you write that the scientists of the Simulatics Corporation, of course, simulation and automatic being the source of the name, acted on the proposition that if they could collect enough data about enough people and feed it into a machine, everything, everything one day might be predictable. And everyone, every human mind 
simulated, each act anticipated, automatically, and even driven and directed by targeted messages as unerring as missiles. Uh, that's from If Then, Jillipore's new book. Uh, I mean, it really does sound exactly like the world we're living in now. And I think it was one of the things that it was so eye-opening to me is that this is 60 years ago, if I'm doing the math right. Um, so the ambition was there, uh, which is kind of amazing to me. How did it first, how did Simulatics then first say, like, okay, here's the first test that we're going to do? Because you write about um, a thing called Project Macroscope. What was that? Yeah, I mean, I think a helpful way for me to recover, because that, that this stuff even has a history is sort of surprising to us. It's such a yeah. part of the myth making of Silicon Valley that all these ideas just spring out of, you know, Zuckerberg's head and Elon Musk's head, and they're all geniuses, and they've never studied anything. It just popped, they're just, you know, it's this brilliant act, single act of brilliance. All this stuff has a really quite a long history. One way that it helps me to think about it in terms of the 1950s, and that, like that language in the passage you read as unerring as missiles, like the, the work that, a, a lot of the math of this kind of prediction and simulation is coming out of defense uh, against mm -hmm. nuclear annihilation. So doing real-time computing comes out of, you know, a project that, it's, that is about anticipating missiles. Um, doing flight simulation for bombers who are going to be dropping bombs. Like all that thinking about the movement of physical objects through space as part of the arms race then gets kind of mapped onto, oh, what if we could control the messages that we send to people and influence their ideas? We could inoculate them against communism. I mean, there's this whole kind of Cold War effort that's called the Minds Race, right? Which is about figuring out how people receive messages and respond to them so that we can win the, the war of, this war of ideas. Um, so it, when you think about it that way, then, oh, of course, this crazy stuff that happens to me on my phone comes from the Cold War. Of course, like of, somehow it begins to make sense that way. Um, so Project Macroscope, what Ed Greenfield read Bill McPhee's dissertation, which was called a fully observable macroscopic electorate or something like that. And Greenfield, like the ad guy, is like, oh, macroscope, that's a cool, that's like, that would be cool. So he calls it Project Macroscope and he writes out a proposal for this voting simulation machine. And he sends it, it's 1959, John Kennedy from, Senator from Massachusetts. Everybody thinks Adlai Stevenson will run for it. Inside, so he uh, Greenfield sends this proposal to the Stevenson guys, um, including Newt Minow, who was had been Stevenson's law partner and was general counsel on his earlier campaigns. People know Newt Minow's name because he goes on um, to be uh, the chairman of the FCC under Kennedy, and he's the Minow in Gilligan's Island. That's the name of the boat because it's an indictment of Minow. Long story. Um, so he, he sends a proposal around, he sends it to people like Minos saying, you know, do you, think Slesen, do you think that Stevenson would like to hire us to do this simulation of the election? Um, and Mino, I, this, is a, this is probably my favorite archival find. I found this in Stevenson's papers at Princeton. Minow forwards the proposal, which is top secret, to Arthur Schlesinger at Harvard, uh, just down the road from where I am here in Cambridge and says, like, do you remember this Greenfield guy? He worked for us in 56. Now he has this crazy idea. What, like, I, I just, I don't know, what do you, I, I wanted some advice from you, because clearly this is immoral. We shouldn't simulate an election <laughs> and tell a candidate what position to take on, you know, civil rights. Or something. And it's also, should, plainly, should be illegal. And then finally, I'm pretty sure it can't possibly work. And it's just so, he has such a clarity about it. He's entirely right. And Schlesinger, who's a real power lover writes back he's like well I, I i agree i mean i agree with everything you say but on the other hand who am i to stand in the way of science what if it works <laughs> well so i okay so i have um the exact language that you that um that they wrote to each other also we should talk for a second about sort of the cambridge cabal part of all of this but um uh, yeah but um so minnow newt minnow writes without prejudicing your judgment my own opinion is that such a thing a cannot work b is immoral C, should be declared illegal. Please advise, right? And so then Schlesinger, as you said, he writes, I have pretty much your feelings about Project Macroscope. I shudder at the implication for public leadership of the notion that a man shouldn't say something until it, until it is cleared with the machine. But then as you point out, he says, he writes, 
I do believe in science and don't like to be a party choking off new ideas. Okay, so this new idea of using masses of the 1959, 1960 version of voter data to predict voter behavior. The first, so the Kennedy campaign says, yes, we'll take this. So first, the DNC says yes. The DNC, um, okay. Really kind of acting on behalf of a possible Stevenson nominee. As, remember, the Democrats had been split uh, into the Dixiecrats and the Democrats because the, the Southern conservatives who were opposed to civil rights and the Northern liberals were in favor of civil rights. And meanwhile, black voters in the North were voting for Eisenhower mm-hmm. in 52 and 56. Uh, the, the, the initial project of the Simulmatics Corporation and of Project Macroscope was to predict how black voters would respond if the Democratic nominee took a stronger position on civil rights. Can I just jump in here for a second, Jill, for a second? Because, I mean, it's important to note that one of the reasons why black voters were voting for Eisenhower is because he had signed the 1957, right? Uh, Yeah. Civil Rights Act of 1957. Like, I mean... We'll come back to that, but I just wanted to, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. arbitrary by any means. Right. No, and in fact, you know, black voters, where they could vote, had been Republicans since emancipation, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's the, was the party of Lincoln. It's not meaningless. Yeah. Um, FDR had, had formed a new coalition during the New Deal and had recruited a lot of black voters into the Democratic Party. Stevenson couldn't do that. Stevenson had a running mate who was a segregationist from Alabama in 52, and he refused to take a strong position on civil rights. Greenfield and all these other northern liberals uh, were so frustrated with the Democratic Party. And we're trying to prove, you know, in swing states, black voters can vote. Like these these northern industrial states, which many of the same states are still swing states. And and Democratic pollsters never polled black voters because they're like, well, they can't vote in the South. And who knows if they'll turn up in the North and probably are lost to the Republicans anyway. And so these guys were like, no, mathematically, they can win the election for the Democratic nominee. The only way we'll win back the White House is if we take... And also, they Greenfield was a very ardent civil rights activist. Like He really did believe in this. He was just trying to find a way to convince the nominee. So the DNC hired them. They do this report on... on it's called Negro Voters in the North. You can find it at the Kennedy Library uh, down the road. Um, and then when Kennedy becomes a nominee instead of Stevenson, the Kennedy campaign hires the Simulmatics Corporation to do three more studies. And they produce three more reports in, in, the, in the weeks leading up, which is like this time of year um, in 1960. Though, and, and those reports say say what? That Kennedy should do what in order to yeah, um, win they, more of the black vote? They say all the, well, they say they've already said the stuff they want to say about the black vote. And, okay. and they, came, they claim credit for the party platform. Um, that comes out of the um, Democratic National Convention, which has the strongest civil rights plank of any party ever. Uh, and the symbolmatics, like, that's because we explained that this is actually necessary. You might say maybe it was the Texas A&M students in Greensboro were <laughs> sitting in, you know, and those students across us out sitting in. There's a lot of other forces that would lead the Democratic Party to take a stronger position. But what they tell the Kennedy campaign is, first of all, you should be forthright about Catholicism. Um, don't don't evade the question. Uh, just take it on. In fact, seek out opportunities to talk about your Catholicism. And they say that their simulations have demonstrated that th- that if Kennedy were to do that, he would lose no more Protestant voters. He'd already lost the ones who were opposed to his Catholicism, but he would gain gain black voters and Jewish voters who he really really needed because they would identify with him being the, a, a member of a persecuted group. Um, so the more he could make himself seem persecuted, <laughs> so it's Catholicism, the better off he would do. They make some recommendations about what he should do um, on civil rights, and, and he ends up reaching out to Martin Luther King's wife after after Martin Luther King is arrested, um, and they give him some advice about the debates, which these televised debates, you know, we're about to have yeah. them now. The, September 26th was, I think, the first one in 1960 between Kennedy and Nixon. Um, yeah, so then when he wins, having done all the things they told him to do, they say... We won the election for you. Okay, so 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 many questions, uh, Jill. But just for folks who might have just clicked and are just joining us now, this is Jill Lepore, Harvard historian, and we are talking about her new book, "If Then: How the Simulatics Corporation Invented the Future." And definitely want to hear your questions, um, viewers who are with us right now. So go to slido.com and put in the event code on point one word, lowercase, on point, and uh, type in your, or tap in your questions there, and we'll try to get to as many of them as 
We can. Um, okay, so so first of all, before we move forward in, ter- in terms of the, the next projects that Simulatics worked on, I want to, you said something which I think we need to spend a little bit of time on. They produced these reports about uh, what Kennedy ought to do or the Kennedy campaign ought to do to win in 1960 regarding um, uh, earning as much of the black vote as possible. But as you said, the civil rights movement was happening at the same time. I mean, uh, uh, as you you write in the book, all people had to do was turn on the TV if they weren't actually in those cities to see what mattered to those Americans. So, I mean, right there, it seems like two things. One is, okay, so maybe Simulatics affirmed the obvious, but what does it say that, I mean, can we say that the Kennedy campaign listened because the machine told them to? And if so, what is, what is, what does that say about who campaigns listen to, to begin with? Yeah, this is what I really struggled with. Maybe tried hard not to be overbearing about this point because I, I feel it so strongly. I, I think I experience it so much. Remember that the term artificial intelligence is coined in 1956, you know, at a conference in Dartmouth of you know a few leading computer men, as they were called. Um, and Simulmatics really is, it sees itself as the equivalent of artificial intelligence. Like it thought it was going to be win the name game, you know, it'd be like cybernetics. But what these people are doing, this collection of people who are what we would call computer scientists um, and behavioral scientists, they're pretty uniformly white liberal men. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to come up with a mathematical model for human behavior in order to predict the behavior of other people um, and have a machine do that prediction because they find themselves kind of baffled, right? And in particular, they come to be really interested in kind of cracking the mystery of the black voter with Simulmatics and then later of the female consumer, right? They do, they do advertising work and then later they predict race rights. I don't mean to jump ahead, but just to say yeah. all these white male liberals are trying to puzzle out, use a computer to puzzle out what do women want? What do people of color want? Like, how do they even think? Like, well, we'll build a machine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that, and that feels so that 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 confusion and bafflement, but mixed with unbelievable audacity and arrogance, just feels really viscerally familiar to me as kind of the mentality of Silicon Valley. The just like checked outness of these some of these guys. I mean, it's just wonderful people that do that. I mean, generalize in this unfair way, but um, you look at some of these CEOs and you're like. Well, but there is. I'm Could you just talk to in. people? Like, what? What about face to face conversation? But I want to ask you about that because the, yes, there is um, there is a belief today in Silicon Valley that if you amass enough data and the right kind of data, that you could solve virtually any problem. Um, and look, there have been great technological advances, and in some fields, um, all of that data actually is going to make a positive difference. But I think the key thing is one of the key things is the right kind of data. So I was seeing here that you wrote that um, only a tiny slice of Simulatic's bank of voters were black to begin with. So what was the quality of the data that they were gathering that would supposedly tell them how yeah. voter behavior would yeah. change? So they were really, they, they did not have the capacity to really gather much data. They weren't a data gathering company, right? They okay. were a pre- analytics company. So they were using for their data to do the simulation of the electorate. They relied on polls. So they got Gallup and Roper to give them hundreds of thousands of punch cards that contained all their polls from 1952, 54, 55, 56, all through the 1950s. And then um, they sorted it out and made it into a data set that could be in conversation with one another. But remember, Gallup, for instance, never, ever, he just did not poll black voters. Um, He ran a nationally syndicated column called America Speaks. Southern newspapers said they didn't want to run it if he was going to ask people about civil rights or if he was going to report the political opinions of black people when they're, you know, their own newspaper readers are disenfranchised if they're black. So the the polling data is completely skewed and unbelievably skewed. Like that mid-century America really relied on polling. Is, is almost as crazy as that we rely on it now. Like, it's just a broken industry. Um, so they could have gone out and done more of their own original polling, but that would have been the only way they could get a better a better representation, uh, like, uh, you know, statistically 
appropriate representation of the population. Yeah. Okay, so with the they Simulatix claims you know that they helped Kennedy win in 1960. So it's it's one thing to say they used the machine to provide predictive analyses for a campaign, but I think actually the more powerful and powerfully chilling uses of Simulatix technology comes later, right? I mean, you mentioned the um, riot prediction machine. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, what I was really struck by in going through the papers of the company is how they try pretty much every realm where we use you know, predictive analytics today. Um, so, you know, trying to convince people to switch brands for of dog food or something. Um, they do all kinds of work, and it doesn't go especially well. The, their, their most successful project is the 1960 election project because it's where they have the best data. Um, in 1960, the company, 65, it's struggling, and they end up um, deciding to do work for the Department of Defense. They go to uh, the office and open an office in Saigon. But that work, it's not computationally complicated. They don't have their own computers in Vietnam, but they're, but they're gathering public opinion information from... Um, they're doing surveys of, of Vietnamese peasants and trying to figure out how to control messages to them. But again, since all of this work in a broad sense comes out of the Cold War campaign to essentially a counterinsurgency campaign to, to, to dissuade people from engaging in revolutionary action, right? We're thinking of communist insurgency and communist revolution. It, 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 it's very easily transferred onto the work of predicting race riots. So, you know, it, people okay, who did so not you know what, the story. Jill, you're going to have... For, yeah. You're gonna for, forgive me because I actually I did this backwards a little bit. The the race uh, the riot prediction machine is important, <clears throat> but the Vietnam story is actually also incredible. Okay, so first of all, basically what you what you write about is that um, LBJ, but Poole Poole goes to the White House several times, and in fact takes his kid sometimes is like sitting there in the Oval Office behind the Resolute desk in LBJ's chair, right? Um, and, and what does Poole say about what uh, Simulatix could do for the, for the Johnson administration regarding Vietnam? What does he claim that they could do? Um, so remember that Johnson's Department of Defense is run by Robert McNamara, who had been the CEO yeah. of the Ford Motor Company. He's a computer guy. He's a systems guy. He wants data. He wants to run this war by collecting data. Um, so a lot of the work that is... Uh, done in Saigon that's part of the counterinsurgency is done by behavioral scientists like all the guys working for RAND like Daniel Ellsberg Daniel Ellsberg who went um, to Vietnam for RAND like these guys are collecting data and they're trying to win hearts and minds but increasingly they're trying to think about ways computationally uh, to do that better more accurately and with you know with with um, greater accuracy in their predictions so Simulmatics goes it's not really even clear to me what the initial contract is I mean they're going to do this survey work they're gathering data um, again, like the military has com has a whole computer unit in Saigon. Like they have a lot of, they're doing a lot of computation. They're, mainly what they're doing is they've set up um, what's called the strategic hamlet situation system where Vietnamese peasants have forced off their land and, and, and um, moved into tiny towns that are heavily militarized um, where they're allegedly, you know, protected from from the war, but really they're being distanced from uh, from the North Vietnamese, so they can't be influenced by them, and so they won't join and, and go fight against the against the United States and against the South Vietnamese. Um, McNamara wants Simulmatics to to conduct an evaluation of the computer program that he's running, that's evaluating the Hamlet, the Strategic Hamlet program, which is just like massively collecting data about each of these strategic hamlets. Like, what was the weather like that day? How much food did people eat? What did this person say? What did that, like this, there's just this kind of giant prediction machine um, that's mm -hmm. looking for evidence that there might be revolutionary action going on there. And Simulmatics is brought in to evaluate that system. It's a kind of, because they are the top of that food chain. Ithiel de Solopool, who's the MIT political scientist who's chairman of Simulmatics Research Board, is, is a brilliant political scientist, um, and, and, you know, reported to me by his former colleagues at MIT, you know, incredibly gentle um, mm -hmm. man, a very devoted cold warrior. Like he wanted, to, uh, he, he wanted the U.S. to win the war in Vietnam. He wanted to save South Vietnam from communism. Um, but it gets, 
I, you know, from my vantage reading his letters and his publication, like really just lost in this fantasy that you can predict human behavior in this way. Um, but he, he, and he's, he's very um, passionately attacked. He's attacked on campus. Noam Chomsky, the linguist uh, at MIT, is the leader nationally of the anti-war movement. He and Poole have this kind of famous debate in Kresge Auditorium, you know, that crazy whale-like building, yeah. <laughs> building over there by Mass Ave. Um, and they, they, they are the, the polls, the opposing polls on the MIT campus. Of, no, you know, polls saying social scientists and behavioral scientists, computer people, we should be involved in the war. We should be aiding the government and winning hearts and minds using whatever tools we have. And Chomsky saying it's, it's an immoral war. It's a, utterly immoral for people with an academic position to be so corrupted as to be involved in waging it. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay, so many really good stories in the book. So uh, forgive me for having interrupted the ra- the riot prediction machine part. So, so that was Vietnam, but but uh, the Johnson administration also wanted, or Simulatics wanted to say, wanted to use um, its technology to predict race riots, like down to like when and where and what time (laughs) such riots might occur in the United States? Well, remember those, you know, those years, you know, 67 in particular, you know, there's the Watts riot in 60. So we're looking at 65, 66, 67. Um, There are, you know, it's controversial to call them riots. There are street protests. There's a lot of violence in reaction to instances of police brutality um, in major cities across the country. Johnson appoints a commission um, headed by Otto Kerner, the former governor of Ohio, to investigate civil disorders across the country. And one of the things the commission is really interested in is something that a lot of police forces are interested in, which is can police forces have computers and enter all the crime data that they have and the social and economic data that they have into them in order to predict when the next riot will happen. So Detroit has one of these computers and it's much like it's really the very same intellectual move as what's going on in Saigon, right? Where they're mm-hmm. trying to kind of look at these hamlets and see, is, is one of them going to break out? Like, are, they, are these going to go, go join the Viet Cong? Um, that, that, the counterinsurgency is counterinsurgency, winning hearts and minds and predicting revolution, you know, which is so much of the project of the Cold War, becomes a project of American policing. Simulatics yeah. does engage in that work, not computationally, like they do They do this crazy project with Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who goes on to find the Joint Center between Harvard and MIT of urban studies. A lot of urban studies is about predicting civil unrest um, and using simulations of urban environments to do so. We still use, that's where SimCity, the game, comes from. I'm sorry, I keep giving you these long answers because like I go from my home. <laughs> I'm leapfrogging from story to story to story, but like it all kind of fits together for me. <laughs> no, it's great. So, but this actually gives me a chance to remind people that um, I'm talking with Jill Lepore, Harvard historian, about her new book, If Then, How the Simulatics Corporation Invented the Future. We've got some questions coming in on slido.com, uh, event code on point. I'll get to those questions, folks, uh, in just a minute. And also, um, there is a link in the description beneath this video to the Brookline Booksmith, brooklinebooksmith.com, uh, if you want to click on that link and buy Jill's book and also support a great local bookstore. Um, but okay, so we could go into a lot of details about all of these stories because I think each one is revealing um, a, in, in its own way. But even in just the ones that we talked about just now, Jill, I mean, the simulatics could claim whatever they wanted to claim about the Kennedy victory in 1960. But as you point out, a lot of the things that they recommended the Kennedy campaign do, maybe the campaign would have done it um, regardless, or were the, these were decisions they were going to make anyway. It's, you know, Vietnam still ended in disaster for both the Vietnamese and the United States. Um, whether simulatics and their analyses had any impact on um, curbing race riots or advancing civil rights, I didn't hear you say that. So this isn't a this isn't a lit- litany of success. I mean, in, in a sense, they promised all this computational power to predict and shape human behavior, but did they at all?
think, though, um, that there's a lot to be seen in what didn't work because the scale of the ambition becomes even more clear as so wildly outsized. And there's all there are also these moments where Poole in particular, who's so brilliant, writes about where this stuff is likely to lead when there is more data. He yeah. writes a bunch of essays in 1968 about what the country would look like in 50 years time. Um, something people in the 60s were really interested in, kind of futurism, right? So that would have been 2018. And he says, you know, one thing we'll be able to have by then is our own personal newspapers. He calls it a personal newspaper. And we could get whatever news seemed to be of interest and relevant to us, but it would probably just confirm things that we already believed or suspected. And you know, it occurs to me that it'd be impossible for the party system to survive that because you know, a party is what organizes people's opinions within a coalition, um, and in you know, newspapers and news outlets that have a partisan position. And you know, then he sort of says, "Well, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out." And there's moment after moment after moment like that throughout the 1960s where very prescient people who are really up to their elbows in this stuff can see where it might go, where it might go wrong. There are a lot of dystopian projections. It's nothing like the kind of dystopianism of the 1960s. It's spookily spot on when you go back and look at it. So from my vantage, like you, as a historian, you're like, why kick that can down the road again and again and again? Why didn't some of those people stop and say, what about setting up some rules? Like, what about thinking about, like, what about not just imagining this stuff, but let's think about imagining a, a rule-based system uh, that could make sure that it doesn't have malign effects on politics and social arrangements. Well, why, so why why didn't they? Especially because, I mean, simu- there was a lot of pushback to simulatics, and it, it only was around for, what, 11, 11 years? And Sorry, my house is not very <laughs> uh, sound, well soundproofed. Um, but, um, so, but why wasn't there that... Uh, uh, that uh, yeah. That follows through, well, that regulatory follow through, yeah. Yeah, so the... I don't mean to just keep throwing stories, but the Johnson administration wants to start a national data center that would be the data version of, like the Library of Congress collects books and National Archives collects manuscripts. The data center would hold personal data that the government had for various purposes that it needed to hold for Social Security Administration or Voting Rights Act Administration. And um, people freaked out. There were congressional hearings like, that's gonna violate our privacy, it's gonna violate our privacy, it's gonna violate our privacy. We don't trust the government because there was a kind of conservative critique of the great society as governmental overreach. And then on the left, there was just kind of panic about privacy. And there's this incredible moment in the hearings where this guy from Rand, who's involved in um, really important technical work that makes possible the internet, he's one of the guys who develops packet switching for the geeks in the crowd. He says to the Congress, he's like, I don't even know why you're holding these hearings. Like, what are you even talking about a national data center? Like, you seem to be discussing a building. We're connecting all the computers up right now, so pretty soon the computers are all going to be talking to one another, and like data will be floating around like in a cloud. So here's what you really need: you don't don't worry about the building. Like make some rules about the data, and they're just like it's. They're like, what are you talking about? The computers are going to like they can't. It's it's the gap between people who are developing emerging technologies and people who are legislating. They, that's why we are where we are now, right? Like Orrin Hatch doesn't yeah. understand how Facebook works. And we still, I was just gonna say, we still have that gap. Yeah, we still so, have that gap. Yeah. I can't well, even use my iPhone as we discussed earlier tonight. <laughs> you, all miss, you all miss that. <laughs> so here's Jill Lepore, like legendary historian, one of the smartest people I've, I've talked to, and she did not know how to close apps on her iPhone, but, um, but that's okay, we got her sorted out. Um, but we've got lots of- I know now, I have the capacity <laughs> to learn. So people are obviously and rightfully keenly interested in what the simulatic story, what we need to learn from it from today. So for for us today, because we are living in that very world that they all predicted um, and wanted to usher in. So so first of all, John is asking, can you talk about the legacy of relying on predictions? Is simulatics work in some way responsible for the way media covered the 2016 election? Yeah, so um, that 1952 clip that we began with, with um, the UNIVAC uh, projecting the outcome in, uh, for CBS News, that trend continues. So in 1960, uh, CBS hires IBM. And IBM puts out this big news flash that they've conducted the fastest reported election ever. So a lot of what's 
just vestigially a problem for us now is you know the expectation that we will have an outcome on election night which in my lifetime people have always had you know historically of course that's really new it is not really until about 1960 that you have that in 1952 the new york times building is still flashing out the results by searchlight from the building's rooftop which is the thing that they do like if it's red they have this whole like that's what a news flash is the news newspaper buildings used to flash out the results like they would put a thing in the paper like like the morse code like two if by land um so the expectation that there's going to be this really really fast calculation um that can be done because it's not even counting all the votes right the votes take weeks and weeks we people don't really it does take a long time to count all those paper ballots all over the country it's largely projections that we're you know that we're relying on and we've come to accept that you know which is increasingly a problem um is that simple Maddox's fault no like i can't lay things on the doorsteps of this company but the general the question of of the acceleration of the transmission of information um of course has like brought humanity great good. So where do you draw the line and say that's too fast um, or maybe speed in this case is, is not what's called for? Uh, th those, are, those are questions that I don't think we've really asked carefully enough. And you know, I often say that um, you know, World War I was kind of the chemist's war and after that war there was a great uh, agonizing shuddering on the part of chemists of what they'd been involved in in terms of chemical warfare. World War II was the physicists' war, and after Hiroshima, physicists were like, what have we done? Um, Vietnam really was the social scientists' war, and they really kind of pulled back. But um, you kind of think that 2016 would have been the computer science world's moment to say, okay, we clearly have not done a good job um, thinking about the implications of our work, and that there would have been a kind of reckoning in it, and it hasn't happened yet. That's, that's the piece that really confuses me. Why, why? Why was 2016 not a moment for... Okay, I understand why the Trump administration didn't want to look into these things. I mean, like, I disagree with it, but I understand what their self-interest was. But why people who uh, founded these companies, why Zuckerberg, uh, why these people are not engaged in, were not immediately engaged in completely reimagining what their work was, the way physicists and chemists have done, biologists inventing the field of bioethics. Why has that not come to pass? Money. I mean... Uh, <laughs> yeah. We haven't talked about that part, but no. also um, why the computer scientists, but all just to bring it back to elections, why why do why does our political system still is is, is in the swoon of the predictive power of data? Because the campaigns I cannot point to you to a single campaign that's saying, no, we're not going to run 40,000 models on every possible thing or every possible response that we could give during a debate to see what would happen. They, they are doing that. There's still a belief in the information that they get from doing these simulations, isn't, isn't there? And I, oh, absolutely. I mean, this book began with an essay I wrote in 2015. And for that essay, I talked to people who do yeah, I talked to someone who works for YouGov, you know, sophisticated quantitative political scientists who write stuff that, that you know, that, that, that people that are doing these simulations and predictions use. And I said, like, imagine, like, if you had the perfect app from your work, like, there was a thing called iCongress, and I'm a member of Congress, and I'm going into a vote, and I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a piece of legislation that I'm strongly opposed to. I think it's bad for my constituents, and I think it's worse for the whole of the country. And it's my job to vote against it. But right before going into Congress, I like check I Congress and I'm, made, I'm giving immediately instantaneous projection of how each of my constituents would respond to my no vote. And I Congress tells me I must vote yes. Was, is that what you're trying to get to? And he was like, well, yeah, that would be great. But OK, that's not our system of government. We don't re elect delegates to Congress. We elect representatives like their job is to think about the public interest and the, the interest of the whole of the country. And, you know, they're not actually supposed to do exactly what their constituents at that second in that split instance, whose information is being delivered to them by all kinds of, you know, moneyed interests. That's not our system of government. Like they, they're, these people are designing tools that are antithetical to a representative's democracy. So no wonder our democracy is falling apart. But why did we let them design them? Yeah, so I think that's a really, really important point that the, the tools aren't necessarily the right tools for what government is supposed to be for, right? 
um, they're good tools for campaigns, but not necessarily for a democratic system. So uh, Tyrone wants to ask you, Jill, do predictive technologies fundamentally subvert democracy? Well, again, let me just say, like, it seems like I, I, I worry I come across as some kind of let it like we need to pre we predict the weather with great accuracy. We think about climate change and climate catastrophe. Uh, we predict the motion of the stars like we, there's a thousand things we predict, you know, biological agents, things that respond to laws of nature that we have deduced. We should be doing this kind of analytical work with. And, you know, God bless the amount of data that allows people to save lives working, you know, working in epidemiology. Like I, this isn't like a like data is bad or science is wrong. Where, the places where predictive analytics seems to me to be ethically incredibly murky, if not just blankly wrong, are where um, for-profit companies are predicting social outcomes and advising policymakers. So if you think about the kind of classic case of uh, bail setting, so there are, there are judges in this country who, in, when it comes to determining whether, you know, you've been arrested, Am I going to let you out on your own recognizance or am I going to set bail at $5? Am I going to set bail at $1,000? And then you're going to have to be, you know, in jail until your case comes up. Instead of, you know, having a conversation with you, listening to your lawyer make the case and the, the, the you know, the, the attorney general make the case or something, I it would go to an algorithm uh, which looks at, which makes an, a risk assessment on, of you based basically on your personal attributes, right? And that algorithm is a black box. It's proprietary information. We as the public can't even see the code. We're not allowed to. Like, that's 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 the that's the money shot, right? Is the code itself? I, I just like, no, no, <laughs> that cannot happen. Or um, there's some. Well, can I just remember, so that's yeah. everywhere, right? I mean, how yes, many people that's think, everywhere. Like, who do who right. apply for sort of a high speed get a high speed answer on their mortgages? I mean, how, how do they think that's happening? I mean, there's an algorithm that's determining whether or not right, the, right. The, it, that person is... Should a, this a child good... be removed from its family and put into foster care? There's an yeah. algorithm that makes that quicker. And departments of families and children services don't have money to do much but use the algorithm in some parts of the country. Yeah. Okay. It's, so, those, so... it's especially social outcomes that affect vulnerable people, right? Yeah. So that's the, that's the you know, it's not... If they were 100% transparent... Um, they weren't affecting vulnerable people. There were appeals available. Like I can imagine ways where people could convince me that that was okay, right? I don't know. Maybe the mortgages. I don't. I would not want to be involved in that. But like, just to just say this is efficient is not enough of a reason to do it when it's mm. unjust. Mm -hmm. So I've got five minutes left with you, Jill. Unfortunately, just five. Um, but I did want to share a little story with you, if I could, because reading your book it reminded me of this. I did an interview in 2015 with Michael Stonebreaker. And he's at MIT, and he's the co-founder of the um, uh, Intel Sciences and Technology Center for Big Data there. And he, in that year, he had won the Turing Prize, um, which is like the Nobel Prize for Computer Science, because he is basically one of the grandfathers of modern day database systems. He helped create the technology <laughs> that is gathering all of this data that we're pouring out into the universe. And I went back and I listened to this interview, uh, Jill, that I did, because uh, I asked him um, about what his concerns are about big data and the use of data and, and predictive analytics. And he stopped me in the interview right then, and, and he said, you know what? Big data cannot predict causality, he said. He said, it cannot say X caused Y. And I was like, well, then what's the point? And he said, he's like, big data can look for a needle in a haystack, but whether they're really needles, the things that identifies, that is something that has to be determined by other means. So that was his way of saying, the data can provide something, but we as society have to decide what it means. And I wonder, how that strikes you and whether or not that question of how do we decide what it means is, is one of the, the questions that, uh, that emerges from, from if then, from your book. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, 
I mean, he's he's right, and responsible scientists and mathematicians working this way would all agree with him, right? They're they're doing very different kind of work. They're doing a more sophisticated kind of sophisticated kind of work, but you know, people are hanging out business signs all over the country saying predictive analytics will be done here. You know, they're, they're promising that they can predict anything, and they're selling a lot of they're selling a lot of hooey for one thing, but meanwhile. Um, I think maybe what that misses a little bit is how much damage can be done to systems that are that are props to the, our institutions, our civic institutions, and that are necessary in a democracy. So I think you know a, a, a predictive analytics package that can tell. Um, a media organization, which of its stories will gain more reader attention and then directs uh, its writers to, and then in the, on the basis of those predictions, that media organization directs its writers to use um, more inflammatory language. Uh, they do A-B headline testing to mm-hmm. uh, come up with a mathematical model of which kind of style of headlines will engage people. Um, you know they are selling they're selling a product that is leading to greater profit for some some people in some industries but that is dismantling a sense of common experience that is you know so much more acutely experienced by all of us today when our only way of interacting with one another um is that you know is this this weirdness um so I get to say that you know that it doesn't tell us that we have to make the meaning of it, sure. But meanwhile, people are making the money from it. Right, right. So I have two minutes left, and I have so many more questions. <laughs> you always do this to me, Jill. Actually, so I'm actually going to just switch gears entirely and ask you one last question. Okay. Okay. And I wonder about this every time you publish a new book. Um, I'm thinking for like Book of Ages when you gave us the story of Jane Franklin, and now this with if then how do first of all do you sleep and second of all how do you find these stories they're they are so so incredible when i whenever i read through them i think how did i not know about this person or this company before how do you do that um i used to sleep until about a (laughs) month ago and now i don't sleep anywhere at all like i don't know when sleep will come back things have to be righted in the world um yeah, you know, I everything that I find um, that I'm excited about doing is something I found in an archive. And what excited me was the kind of intimacy of only I have seen that. Do you know when you check um check a book out of the library and there's there's no one else's stamp on the in the call slip in yeah. the back, and then there's some uncut pages. The uncut pages are like incredibly magical. Like. You have to get out some kind of kitchen knife and slice the page. You're like, no one has looked at this page before. I don't know. I just like, I get a kick out of that. So I I like telling obscure stories. Um, I like the challenge of that. Like writing a presidential biography does not appeal to me. Like reading through the 500 volumes of the papers of Lyndon Johnson. Like I would just, would not want to do that. So I I, I get very excited about the find. Um, And then I get excited trying to, make it into an allegory for a much bigger problem or um, uh, transformation or change over time. So yeah, I get really like, the the reason I write so many books is I get really interested in something and actually then I hate writing books. So I'm desperate to be done. Like I love writing essays, (laughs) but I hate writing books. So I'm so, I'm like, oh God, I found this thing. The, you know, some of the I found in the archives at MIT, incredible librarians to work with. And and I was like, oh, I have to write a book about this. Like, it's going to take me for, like, so I rushed through the book so that I can be done so that I can move on to something else because I really don't like writing books. So that, that's, that's, it's, oh, it's, it's, I... it's all about like the compete competition of my many vices. <laughs> Thank you for enduring the pain of writing books for us, Jill. <laughs> I mean, so, cause they are incredible. So well, I like come talk to you about talk them. Show host. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing my talk show host impression here and showing you the cover of the book, everyone. It's If Then by Jill Lepore. How the Simulatics Corporation invented the future. Uh, Go to the, I think there's a link again um, in the description beneath this video and you can buy the book from the Brookline Booksmith. Brookline Booksmith, 
uh, dot com. Jill, it's been really wonderful to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending the hour here. Yeah, super great as always. And so good to uh, not see, but know about all those WBUR people out there. So thanks everyone for coming in. Thanks so much to the Brookline Booksmith. Buy other books when you go over to their website too. So <laughs> thanks everyone. Um, and uh, for all of you who are here, um, thank you for joining this conversation and for watching and stay in the loop with all the events that we're doing virtually or otherwise is still mostly virtually so we're really grateful that you um, are with us and you can sign up for our events newsletter just go to wbur.org slash city space again that's wbur.org slash city space for that events newsletter and i hope to see you again in um, another event very soon thanks very much and good night <laughs>